I remember there was a time when, um, you know, I was still at the church my parents were going to, and it was a pretty good and tight-knit community. And I remember that there was this really loving couple that moved away. Uh, they moved about two hours away from the church. And so because of that, we were really sad because they would no longer be attending our church. And we were really sad to see them go. After some time passed, we got really excited because they invited our family along with some other church families to go and visit their home. And I was really excited to visit them because, well, well, number one, I hadn't seen them for a long time. And number two, I was really excited to visit them because I had heard that they moved into the same neighborhood where Tiger Woods and Shaq also had a house. And so on that day, we were going to visit for an entire weekend. And I remember when we pulled into the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood did not disappoint my expectations. When we pulled into their driveway, their driveway and their home did not disappoint my expectations. I remember when they were giving us the house tour, we finally made it upstairs. And as we were going into the hallway leading into the media room, I noticed my feet. I, I had never felt this before. Right? It was a foreign texture. I was, what am I walking on? The entire hallway leading into the media room and the whole floor of the media room. What? Is that? And so it, it wasn't carpet. It wasn't tile. It wasn't vinyl. It wasn't hardwood floor. The hallway and the media room, the flooring was leather. So I'm gently walking. I don't want to ruin anything. And they say, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Here, have, you know, take your food in there. Eat. Enjoy. Right? At night, we went out into the backyard, and we enjoyed a personal fireworks display. And the family lived close enough to Disney World off of the lake. Right across the lake was Disney World. So every night when Disney was giving its fireworks display, the family got its own personal daily, nightly fireworks display off of their dock. It's pretty neat. As we're going to their home, as we're touring their house, as we're seeing all of these things, the conversation amongst the families was praise God. The conversations while we're looking at all the things that they had, we're remarking about how God answers prayers. We're remarking about how good God is. Leather floors, God is good indeed, right? Let's change pace here. Oftentimes I find that I have to examine my heart. Um, To be honest with you, I need to examine my heart oftentimes when I read updates from missionaries. And, and, And this is why. I think it came down to this. I found myself being very critical when I read updates from missionaries or I saw pictures from missionaries. And I think I had to examine my heart because oftentimes I got uncomfortable. And the problem was where that discomfort was coming from. And after some reflection and prayer, I realized this. I don't know if it's true for you. When you think of missionaries you're supporting or PCAs you're supporting, when it came to me, it would make me very uncomfortable the idea if a missionary had the same lifestyle as me. So let me put it this way. I'll be at Starbucks sipping on my latte, all right, enjoying the free Wi-Fi, the ambiance, and I'll open up my email. It'll be an update from a missionary overseas. And as I'm reading through this update from the missionary overseas, I'll see a picture from the missionary from overseas. As I look closely at the picture, I'll see that the missionary is holding a Starbucks drink, and I'll think to myself, man, is that the best way you could be using your money? You know, if you didn't drink Starbucks, you could save money, as I say to myself, sipping on my latte, right? What if? What if a missionary overseas had a house as big as my house? What if a missionary had a house as big as your house? I don't know about you, but I could come up with a very strong list of ways and reasons that they should downsize and how that would help expand God's kingdom. 
you know, three years ago when Nellie and I got a car, we bought a brand new car off the lot. But when I hear missionary updates, I expect the missionary to find an old beater, right? Man, it, it, it's great. Praise God if they salvage it off the junkyard. You know, praise God if it's a loner on its last leg. And if it is a new car, if it is Starbucks, if their house is as big as my house, if they have a flat screen the size of my flat screen, then, you know, my heart goes to bad places. I think, man, are they being worldly? I thought they were supposed to surrender to God. But what about me? So why is it both ways? Why is it at times that we can look at some people and we can look at all the things that they have in this world? We can look at all the material things and we can say, wow, praise God. We can look at all the things that they have and we can say, man, God loves you. You are faithful. You love God. Why can we look at all the things that they have and say, man, leather floors, God is good. But then at the very same time, we look at other people and we look at the stuff that they have and we say, wow, you're greedy. Wow, I don't know if you know God's love. I don't think you love God because look at all the stuff that you have. So why is it that there is this double standard that's going on? When it comes down to it, the problem exists because we're using the wrong standards to evaluate whether or not God loves us and to evaluate whether or not we understand God's love and we love God in return. The standard of measure of evaluating whether or not God loves you should not be based upon your worldly treasures. And the standard of whether or not you love God should not be solely based upon how much stuff you do or don't have. So what is the proper standard of evaluating whether or not you understand and you grasp God's love for you and you love him back in return? What is the proper standard, the proper metric, the proper measure to prove that, yes, you understand God's love and you love God in return? This morning, we want to see a problem, a solution, and application. The problem. What is the problem with using the wrong metrics? What is the problem with using the standard of how much stuff do you have? Then the solution. What is the proper metric? And then application. In light of Scripture this morning, what are we to do? How are we to live? What are we to change? This morning, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to be in verses 1 through 4 this morning. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. You can find Matthew at the very beginning of the New Testament. If you take your Bible, split it directly open in the middle, go a little bit towards the right, past Malachi, you'll land in Matthew. If you see Mark, Luke, John, you've gone too far. Matthew chapter 4, and this morning we'll just be in verses 1 through 4. Matthew is written by the apostle Matthew, and he's writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. We see in chapter 1, Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and he begins that genealogy significantly enough with Abraham. There's no question for the Jews who Abraham is in the call that God and the purpose that God has given to him. And so Matthew, trying to deliver the good news of Jesus Christ to show the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah, shows the link from Abraham all the way to Jesus. Between Abraham and King David, there are 14 generations. Between David and the exile into Babylon, there's another 14. Between the exile in Babylon until the birth of Jesus Christ, another 13. Before chapter 4 and chapter 3, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. And in chapter 4, verse 12, Jesus begins his earthly ministry. So after Jesus' baptism and before Jesus begins his ministry, there's chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And here in verses 1 through 11, Jesus is led to the wilderness 
to be tempted. Before Jesus begins his earthly ministry, Jesus establishes, he proves that he is the Son of God. He proves that he is loved by the Father and that he loves the Father in return. How does Jesus prove that he is the Son of God? Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. During Jesus' life on this earth, Jesus does not his own will, but Jesus does the will of the Father according to the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is the Father's will that before Jesus begins his ministry, that Jesus go into the wilderness to be tempted. And so he's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 2, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Going without food for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is hungry. Jesus is fully God, but at the same time, he is fully man. And so he would experience all the pains, all the hungers that you and I would. Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days, and this alludes to Israel's wandering in the wilderness after their exodus out of Egypt. Israel wanders in the wilderness for 40 days. But unlike the Israelites, Jesus grows hungry, he grows tired, but he does not sin against God. Israel, on their hand, does. Jesus is fully obedient and faithful to the Lord. Verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God, Prove that you are the Son of God. If you are who you say you are, if you are loved by God, if you love God, if you are the Son of God, prove it. How? Turn these stones into loaves of bread. This is a temptation to sin. And why is this a temptation to sin? As the Holy Spirit has led Jesus out into the wilderness and to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, as a human, what would his body be craving the most? What would his body be needing? No doubt Jesus was hungry. No doubt he was famished. No doubt he was starving for food and earthly sustenance. Can Jesus, does he have the power to turn the stones into loaves of bread? Yes. So what's so wrong with him turning loaves of bread into food and eating it? Turning the loaves, turning the stones into bread would be sin because it would be satisfying his own desires against the Father's. Jesus is in the wilderness and he is fasting, and he is hungry. Why? Who led him out there? The Holy Spirit led him out there according to the will of the Father. It is according to the Father's will that Jesus should fast. Therefore, for Jesus to break the fast, to satisfy his own needs through earthly things, would be a sin and disobedience against the Father. Prove to me that you are the Son of God. By relying on earthly things, even such as food, earthly sustenance, Jesus would not be proving that he is the Son of God, but in fact, he would be doing the opposite. Through his disobedience, he would be disproving that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Prove to me that you are the Son of God. Prove to me that you are a child of God. Prove to me that in Christ, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. How does turning to worldly things do the opposite of that? 
there's this video of, of these three girls, and, and they're, they're at a young age. They're at that age where dad's Superman. Where dad is the grace. I, I remember when, when I was a kid getting into arguments with other people's kids, saying, no, my dad's stronger. No, your dad's stronger, right? My dad's stronger, right? Uh, no, my dad's stronger, right? My dad could beat your dad in an arm wrestling contest, right? Oh, yeah, my dad could body slam your dad, right? And so these three girls are eating popsicles, and they're bragging about their dads, about their fathers, right? So in this video, the girl on the far left, she's really proud about her dad. And so really proudly, she proclaims, my dad has a gold tooth. And you hear the girl on the right side gasp, and her eyes light up. And that's the coolest thing she's ever seen or heard. And you can tell at that moment, she's going to give the honor and the reward, the crown to that king. Gold tooth. But then in the video, you see the girl in the middle. Oh, she's not letting Gold Tooth Dad have it, right? You can see her gears start turning. No, my dad's better. And so she's got it. She says, well, interrupting everything, right? And as proud as one's daughter could be, she brags about her father. And she says, well, my dad has diabetes, Seeking to brag about her father, she failed to brag about her father. Seeking to brag about her father, she could have told of all these things, but instead she named and listed the things that do not brag about her father. Boast and brag about how great God is. How would you tell the world, my God is greater than your God? My God is greater than the world. My God is greater than your idols. Prove to me that you are a child of God. Prove that I love God and that God loves me. How would I do that? You know, God loves me and I love God, and this is proof. God loves me and I love God because he let me go to university. He let me go to seminary. He let me get a great education. Proof, God loves me. You know, God loves me and I love God because, man, before the market went crazy, he let Nellie and I buy a house for a good price and I have a roof over my head. God loves me. Proof. Let me prove to you God loves me because I got two wonderful dogs. Let me prove to you God loves me because I have a wife that loves me. Let me prove to you God loves me because I get to serve at PCAC and I got a nice little office over there. Seeking to brag about my father God, I just failed to boast about God. When I look to my earthly things and earthly treasures to brag and boast about God, I end up insulting and distracting from God. Does that make sense? Prove to me that God is good. Oh, let me tell you about how good God is. You know, I went to the University of Florida. I went to DTS. I went to these great universities. Wait, how good is God? Oh, university, university education. Tell me, boast about how good God is. Okay, you know, I got this nice house in plain. Wait, wait, wait. What about God? Well, I got this house, and you should see the house. Prove to me God is good. I'll prove it to you. Man, I got a loving wife. I got a mother and father. I got a... Wait, 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 wait. But what about God? In boasting about God by talking about earthly things, I've just told you that God isn't that important to me. I've told you that my education is the proudest thing in my life. I've told you that shelter is the most important thing that I need. I've told you that my earthly peer-to-peer, people-to-people relationship is so intimate and so close. I can tell you about that. I don't know if I have a relationship with God. 
boast about God your Father, not by bragging about all your earthly things. Because on the flip side, what does that say for those who have little? Look, God loves me. I have all this stuff. But what about those people who have little in this world? Are you going to tell them that God doesn't love them? Are you going to tell them that they have little because they don't love God? Prove to me that you are the Son of God. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Satan is tempting Jesus. Prove to me that you are the Son of God. Prove to me that the Father loves you and that you love the Father. How? By turning to earthly things. But turning to earthly things does not prove that God loves you and that you love God, but in fact, it proves the opposite. It distracts from God and shows that your treasure, that your heart is of the things of the world. So what is the solution? If looking to all your earthly treasures is not evidence that God loves you, is not evidence that you love God, what is proof, what is evidence that you know that God loves you and that you love him back? The solution is in Jesus' response back to Satan. Verse 4, but he answered, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus' response is to go back and to quote Deuteronomy 8, the words of Moses. As Israel, as the God's people are wandering in the wilderness, they're hungry. And so God says manna down from heaven, this white flaky substance for them to eat. And as they're eating and they have this provision. Moses is reminding God's people, hang on one second. It is not this food that is sustaining you. It is not the things of this earth that is sustaining you. But what sustains you? Man shall not live by bread alone. It is not bread that gives us life. It is not things and treasures that gives us life. It is not our home, our house, it is not your salary, it is not your job, it is not your education that gives you life and purpose, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is obedience to God that proves and shows that we understand God's love and that we love God. I would always complain to my parents, or predominantly to my mom, that I didn't like the food that she cooked, right? Um, and, and, and I would gripe about it all the time. Uh, middle school, high school, and, and I would always want to go and eat out, right? Every day, I'd come home and complain to my mom, right? Can we go eat out? Can we 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 eat out? Right? I complain so much, right? This, this one time, I came downstairs after my mother called for supper, and, and I looked at the d dinner table, and the dinner table didn't have food on it. I got excited. I said, are we going to eat out today? My mom says, you sure are. She opened the back door, and my dinner was on a table outside. <laughs> uh, she said, go eat out, all right? Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Every time we went to eat out, I, I really liked you know, to go eat Japanese food, right? And uh, I would always order, um, you know, the bento box, right? You get the rice, you get, you can get the teriyaki chicken, orange chicken, uh, you get the salad, you get, you get a little bit of everything. I love the bento box. I asked for it so much that it just became shorthand. My, I want to eat box, I want to eat box, I want to eat box, right? I want to eat box, I want to eat box, right? Uh, this one time I, I came down for dinner uh, after my mother had called for supper, and my, my mother grabbed a cardboard box. She slapped it on the dinner table. 
And she took the food that she had made and put it inside the box. And I came down and I said, what is this? And she said, eat box. <laughs> so many times, you know, mom, dad, if you love me, if you truly love me, you'll let me eat out. Mom, dad, if you love me, you'll let me eat box, not cardboard box, but bento box, okay? Mom, dad, if you love me, you'll give me a car. Mom, if you truly love me, you'll let me hang with my friends. Mom, dad, if you love me, you'll do this, you'll do that for me. The more and the more that I demanded my parents prove that they love me by demanding more things from them, all the more I proved that I did not understand their love for me, all the more it proved that I did not love them. All that they had provided and had already given me, of all the ways that they had loved me, things aside, should have been proof enough of their love for me, and how would I prove my love for them? Not by asking and demanding for more things, but absolute proof that I understand my parents' love for me and that I love them back would be expressed through obedience to them. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. God did not owe us that, and he sure does not owe us anything now. To demand anything more from God is a surefire proof that you and I do not understand God's love for us. To say, God, if you love me, you'll give me this job. God, if you love me, you'll give me this school. God, if you love me, you'll give me this relationship. Every demand that we have of God, God, give me, if you love me, is proof that we don't know that God loves us. Is proof, perhaps, that we have failed to love God in return. So what then? What is a true evaluation? What is a true metric of whether or not you understand God's love for you and whether or not you love God in return? The true measure should be based upon your obedience to God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The greatest proof that we believe in God, the greatest proof that God is real to us is not by demanding more from God, but by obeying his every word. The greatest proof that God loves us that we can give to the world is not by counting all the things and the stuff that we have in this world, but by being obedient to God in his word. Do you know and understand God's love for you? Do you love God? Well, yeah. You know, God loves me because look at, look at this big building we have. Well, yeah, God loves me because, you know, I got a car I can drive. Yeah, God loves me. No, no, no. Do you know that God loves you? And do you love God? Well, yeah, I know God loves me. I love God because he gave me all this stuff I asked for. And man, no, no, no. What is the greatest proof that you believe God is real? by obeying him. What is the greatest proof that you love God?
by obeying him. Prove to me God is real and that you love God. And I hope that as a church, as PCAC, the conversation would be, here's proof. Look at how we're reaching the nations. Here's proof. Look at our missions fund. PCAC, prove to me that you understand God's love, his grace and mercy for you. And I hope that our response would be, man, here's proof. Look at how we're taking God's love and we're reaching out to our community, reaching out to our neighborhood. Look at how we're loving others, how we're loving God. Look at how we're fulfilling the Great Commission by making disciples here, near, far. Making disciples of all nations. That would be the strongest proof of all that we know that God loves us and we love him. Let's take some time to pray and to meditate upon God's word this morning. Before we go into song and to continue to worship him, before we race off into all the things that we have to do after service, let's just take time to pause and to reflect on our lives. God's word tells us who the Holy Spirit is and what his role is. It is impossible for any of us to change one another. It is impossible for any of us to change ourselves. It is impossible for any of us to recognize our own sin. It is impossible for any of us on our own to repent of our sin. So that is why the Holy Spirit is so important. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin and righteousness. It is the Holy Spirit who reveals to us what is right and what is wrong. It is the Holy Spirit who lets us know that we are sinners and show us us and enable us, empowers us to repent it is the Holy Spirit who teaches us what is good and righteous according to the Lord. And it is the Holy Spirit who then empowers us to obey the Lord. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, I thank you for your example of how you humbly came, fully God as fully man. You surrendered your rights to live, to be punished, and to die on a cross for our sins. I thank you that you showed God's love. You showed that you loved the Father through your perfect obedience. And I pray, God, and I thank you that you made your no will known to each and every one of us. I thank you that you revealed yourself in so many wonderful ways that because of creation, no one can deny that there is a creator. And through your word, no one can deny that God has spoken. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing us the way. I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning, for the times that our reliance upon our relationship with God is upon how much stuff we have or we don't have. May we repent of the times that we feel close to you because of how many things we have, how many things are going our way. And we repent of all the ways that we've doubted you when we look around and we don't have the things that we want. 
when things aren't going our way. God, you don't need to do anything to prove that you love us. The question this morning is this. Do we love you? May we show it by obeying you. Heavenly Father, for those of us who have much, may we not rely on all the things that we have been given. But I pray, Holy Spirit, that we show how we are to utilize our position of having much to obey you. If it is to give, to use, to surrender the much, that we do those things out of obedience to you. That as you give us much and that we have much, may we not become idolaters. May we not worship things above you. That we may not become distracted. May we remain obedient to make disciples of all nations. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who find themselves having not so much. Perhaps they're not at a place that they desire to be in terms of earthly wealth and treasure and status. Perhaps they're behind on their five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan. Perhaps they've been going through struggles and hurts. And because of this, they're doubting your love and they're wondering where you are. I ask that you give them hope to know that you love them because of your son, Jesus Christ, and that they're able to continue to love you even through little, through obedience. How do you know God loves you? The greatest proof you can give is by surrendering your own desires and your earthly treasures. Because it shows that God is real and is worth it. You can prove that God is real by sharing about Jesus Christ, even if it's going to cost you your reputation, even if you'll be humiliated by the rural world, because it'll show everyone that that's worth it. That's how real God is to you. You can prove that God is real to you by spending your time, energy, and resources by pouring into those who are younger, not just by age, but through spiritual maturity, that you make disciples, that you teach them all that God has commanded you in order to obey Jesus Christ. Because we all know your time, your energy, your resources is so valuable but why is that person not spending time for himself, but giving it to others? Because that's how real God is to them. And Father, I pray that you teach us to obey to not only be knowers and hearers of your word, but doers as well. I pray these things in Jesus' name.